In this video we will look at various reasons why intelligence failure happen and also why most measures that try to reduce the problems don't work. For the uninitiated we start with a little introduction into intelligence itself. So what is intelligence? Let's start with a definition and then explore it a bit more. Intelligence is information concerning a foreign entity, usually although not always, an adversary, as well as agencies concerned with collection of such information. Hence, to produce intelligence, data must be collected, processed and analyzed. As you can see from this illustration, taken from a joint Chief of Staff publication. The data gets collected from the operational environment, which is then processed into information and finally transformed into intelligence by analysis. To put it simply, data is a raw material and intelligence is a product. Since we have a product, there are also consumers, which are usually government or military officials. Note that the word of consumer and recently user is official terminology. Intelligence products provide users with the information that has been collected and analyzed based on their requirements. It is important to remember that because the operational environment is dynamic, intelligence is a continuous activity. The intelligence cycle or process has usually four to six activities, depending on the perspective. In this case we go with the joint intelligence process that entails six intelligence operations. Planning and direction, collection, processing and exploitation, analysis and production, dissemination and integration, and evaluation and feedback, which happens continuously during the whole process. Note that not every activity requires every operation. For instance, a request for imagery may require planning and direction, but if the imagery already exists, there is no collection nor processing involved. Somebody just gets it from the archive. Also, many operations happen simultaneously and continuously. Now, the classical four branches of intelligence are human intelligence, signal intelligence, imagery intelligence and measurement and signature intelligence. Furthermore, others list also geospatial intelligence, open source intelligence, technical intelligence and count intelligence. Human intelligence is probably the oldest and most low tech of these. It is concerned by information that is collected and provided by human sources, like James Bond, but also the interrogation of prisoners or simple informants. Signal intelligence deals with the interception and analysis of signals. These are not limited to communication signals, for instance detecting various electric emissions. One important part of signal intelligence is script analysis, that deals with the deciphering of messages. Whereas another is traffic analysis, that deals with patterns. Imagery intelligence was once called photographic intelligence, which includes information gathered by observation balloons, recomplaints and up to satellites. It is not limited to photographs anymore. It also includes all kinds of imaging technology like radar and infrared sensors. Measurement and signature intelligence deals with the quantitative and qualitative analysis of data to derive distinctive characteristics. It often uses existing data from various branches. For instance, various information collected by radar and other sources are combined to locate or classify a target. Geospatial intelligence combines various data like imagery and geographical locations into simple products like maps, or more complex products like maps that indicate the location of enemy troops and their movement. Open source intelligence uses sources that are open to the public, like newspaper articles, encyclopedias, government budgets, lectures and various other published or unpublished materials from archives. It is often used to complement and or verify existing information. Technical intelligence is intelligence derived from foreign scientific data or equipment. For instance, testing captured equipment in order to get a clear picture of the various capabilities and weaknesses of the enemy equipment. Finally, counterintelligence is concerned with protecting against foreign powers or other adversaries. So since we got that covered, why do intelligence failures happen? Well, for the most part, the failures actually happen outside the intelligence services, according to Richard Betts. In the best known cases of intelligence failure, the most crucial mistakes have seldom been made by collectors of raw information, occasionally by professionals who produce finished analysis, but most often by the decision makers who consume the products of intelligence services. Yet it is important to note here that he states best known cases 
And also we need to consider that major failures are often the result of decisions. And those are usually not taken by the members of the intelligence services. Hence it is quite natural that most failures ultimately are the result of people who make the call. And not of those who write the report. Nevertheless, the weakest link seems to be in the decision makers. So how can the process be changed to limit the failures on their side? Most failures are often backtracked to the various constraints of organizations and the limits or features of human psychology. For instance, if we take a very simple scenario, we have an operator that collects data in the field. Then we have an analyst who processes this data into intelligence. And then there's a decision maker. The operator usually has a direct involvement to the data and situation, which gives him more insights, but he is also more emotionally invested and more likely to miss the big picture. Let's assume he retrieved a document with vital information on a case he works on. This can be a big thing for him, but for the analyst, who is more distant, it is just one small part in a larger puzzle. So he might have a more objective view. Yet decision makers are often fixated on current intelligence and raw data. Whereas the reports from analysis are often less attractive. To quote Betts, Moreover, principals tend to believe that they have a wider point of view than middle-level analysts and are better able to draw conclusions from raw data. This is sometimes aggravated by the outside circumstances. For instance, when data is coming in faster than it can properly processed and analyzed. The next problem is the general ambiguity of evidence. A major problem with assessing failures from the past is hindsight. Since we know not only how certain events worked out, we also live in a world where many unknowns of the past are now fundamental beliefs that were not certain or quite opposite back then. For instance, we know that organizing tanks into independent divisions is the right thing to do, but in the 1930s there were just a few people that believed it and basically no evidence at all to support their views. Intelligence inherently operates in an environment of ambiguity. After all, it is the role of intelligence to extract certainty from uncertainty and to facilitate coherent decisions in an incoherent environment. Now, uncertainty is often due to the inadequacy of data. Yet this inadequacy of data can be both stem from the lack of information, but also from the excess of information. A high volume of analysis, statistics and reports from several channels can lead to overload. Yet decision makers need to make judgments that often can't be delayed. Thus in the end it often comes down to decisions based on simple assumptions. And these assumptions can shape the interpretations, for example. Observers who assume Soviet malevolence focus on analysis of strategic forces that empathize missile throw weight and gross megatonnage the Soviet advantages. Those who assume more benign Soviet intentions focus on analysis that amplifies missile accuracy and numbers of warheads, the US advantages. Basically, when the situation is ambiguous, there are usually many indicators and that means that there is some evidence to support any prediction. Ultimately, a decision maker might go with his interpretation based on a limited analysis, whereas an analyst might disregard his own analysis because it doesn't provide a conclusive answer yet. But those are the limits of the situation and not necessarily the system or intelligence process. Because when a decision is necessary, a call must be made. No structure nor process can prevent it. There are many approaches to deal with ambiguous situations. One is to assume the worst case scenario in case of a threat. If there's any evidence of threat, assume it is valid, even if the apparent weight of contrary indicators is greater. The complication is that this only seems a good idea in hindsight, but without hindsight it is unfeasible or might even escalate the situation that was not problematic at all. Worst case assumptions are often not feasible because worst case analysis and preparations usually require extraordinary resources and also can lead to the escalation of the situation. Because the actions taken may be perceived as aggressive by the enemy. Also, always assuming the worst case will wear down the personal and lead to routine. Another approach to deal with uncertainty is to maximize the number of perspectives for the leadership. For instance, by listening to several analysts that disagree with each other. The problem here is that this can lead to even more ambiguity. 
Additionally, this would put more strain on the decision makers in terms of time and attention. One way to deal with intelligence failures on an organizational level are reforms on the procedures and or structures. Yet such changes can erode over time, if they ever work at all. Habits change slowly and also if a key problem is limited resources, any restructuring will usually strain the resources even more. Restructuring the procedures by adding additional safety measures for errors might sound great on paper, but if the staff is overworked, this might not help at all, or wear down in a matter of months. Another problem with reforms is that they may reduce danger in one area, but they may increase it in another. For example, after the Pueblo incident, the responsible person implemented a procedure to prevent that an important message got misplaced again. Yet implementing this check, however, created a 3 to 4 hour delay, another potential source of failure in getting cables to desk analysts whose job was to keep reporting current. To sum it up, the main problem with dealing with shortcomings in the intelligence and decision making process is that measures will often introduce structures or procedures that are as or even more counterproductive. Intelligence operates in an environment of uncertainty, ambiguity and time constraints. These factors are severe enough even without the various psychological dispositions to lead to various problems. Hence it is important to focus on a proper trade-off. Covering every hypothetical vulnerability would lead to bankruptcy and hedging against one threat may aggravate a different one. The problem is thus one of priorities and hedging against uncertainty is hardly easier than resolving it. Or to take a more sarcastic stance, a retiree of the British Foreign Office who served from 1903 to 1950, supposedly stated the following. Year after year, the warriors and fretters would come to me with awful predictions of the outbreak of war. I denied it each time. I was only wrong twice. Thank you for watching, stay tuned and see you next time.